Wow. Cool. I've been there for I'm um, coming up on next year. I'm um, coming up on 40 years of service. Wow. Since you were 10. I'm also uh, my my staff's uh, president, so I tell them that evil doesn't age and be careful. <laughs> Mickey, I hate to tell you this, there is some static from that thing when you turn your head. Or, yeah, yeah. The microphone's very. Yeah, whenever you if you touch it or anything, we get terrible static. Yeah, so as long as I don't touch it, we're good. Okay, seems to be. Seems to be. So how's everybody's week been? <laughs> Quiet. Yeah, this is the first time I was back on campus since we left March 13th. We wow. started Monday. We had a delayed school opening. All of our classes got delayed for retrofits until the 21st, which was Monday. So we're having 5% classes online, and they're only for like certain um labs that you can't do remotely because we have one four four medical stuff that you can't do. Kenneth, are you still away in Rhode Island? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. We, we're, no. All right. We're on two phones. Internet is down. This is the process figuring it out. All right. Well, we can hear you fine. Are you still in Rhode Island? Kenneth, can you hear me, Kenneth? Kenneth, what's very the... faintly on my phone? I don't know how to do the volume for that. Okay. Phone to settings. Never, never mind. Hi, Sherry. Sherry, Sherry, I said hello and you disappeared. What did you do? Did I scare you away? She's kidding. <laughs> Your volume is good, no? Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Oh, hello. I'm back. I just switched too far in it. It, it went to, I don't know, Morning. Rhode Island. Okay. So I, think, I think they're back from Rhode Island. Uh, hey, someone's running water. If you're running water or doing anything in the background, please mute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, it's on the kitchen table. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, that was my husband um, making a smoothie, so I yelled at him. <laughs> um, Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, Rabbi's here. I'm here. So behave, everybody. Yeah, behave. Yeah. Harold, um, Ira, wrote, Ira wrote to me about going to the gym in the neighborhood here, so they're back. Oh, okay. Okay, so they're back. Got Has it. anybody been back to a gym? No, this is such no. a good excuse not to go. I have a six-month um, six medical leave from Equinox, but I'm having my trainer come and uh, we're going to do zoom uh fitness three times a week i did zoom i i it stopped now because of the high holidays but the one thing i did starting in april is that i had a zoom personal trainer three times a week mm -hmm. otherwise i was literally not getting any you know and i'm so bad i'm just i'm like i'm not like harold and ira who's off on bicycles for these incredible rides all over the place <laughs> Harold, I, you know, under, I saw on Harold's Facebook. So Harold, you've been doing bike stuff forever. This isn't a recent thing for you, huh? No, no, no. Since the uh, AIDS ride in 1995. Wow. I, I actually, I had not ridden a bicycle as an adult. I did not have a bicycle as an adult. But it was one of those things where the minute I heard about the AIDS ride, I said, and you know, and going from not riding at all to riding 300 miles in three days, I thought I should do this. And I you know, it wasn't even Facebook. I called around and said, does anyone have a bicycle that I can borrow? So I borrowed a bicycle. And actually, I trained some. I was so afraid that I did all of the training rides. And I even went to bicycle camp. You know me. I'm, yeah. all, I'm in, I'm all in. I went to bicycle camp in Colorado. And you going to say you went to bicycle camp in Latin. Yeah, in Latin, yeah. Went and rode in the Rockies. Um, Wow. And, oh, and Karen Kropp is saying she did the 95 AIDS ride too. It was really, a, it was an amazing experience. Was that the first one of the AIDS ride? Was was, the there had been one in 94 in Los Angeles, and then it was the first one on the East Coast. And they've changed it since then, but there were 3,500 people um, on this ride. We were, we were all camping. So it was quite the, and it was the first time I had ever gone camping either. I know, I was going to say, that's hard for me to imagine too, Harold. 
I know, I know, but no. So, and then, and then it turned out that I liked bicycling. So I did that. I did three of the eight rides and then just kept on bicycling. Do they still do it where everybody camps or do people say no? no? They have fewer people now and they put them in hotels and they've raised the fundraising amount. So it's not the whole, it's not the big mass ride that it used to be. And Shep says that he crewed for the 1995 AIDS ride. It was so much fun. Are you a serious biker too? Do you do bicycling? Karen? So me? Karen. Or, yeah, Karen. Crow. Um, I, I have been. I do ride. I, it is my form of exercise, definitely, up here in Connecticut. And a couple of years ago, we as a family went on a bike trip in Croatia. So, oh, wow. Cool. I wouldn't call myself super serious, but maybe, you know, I still ride a bike. <laughs> I ride a bike once a year in P-Town with one arm. It's kind of a challenge. <laughs> oh, yeah. The poor worker blames his tools, right? <laughs> but I, I, I'm going to get a prosthetic that's going to attach to the... I'm going to try to get a prosthetic that attaches to the handlebar to give me balance. Shep, I have to say, it's a bit of a relief that you're not on that bridge. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in P-Town still. <laughs> A little calmer, isn't it? Doesn't don't you feel more relaxed? But Randall Axelrod, she's there at the uh, at the Golden Gate, huh? Oh, yeah. So I have to ask everybody: raise your hand if you thought that our Rosh Hashanah services were the best services ever in the history of Judaism. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. All right. So. And then you don't want to go back to live services? I love it. I have to put on clothes and shoes. I know. It's I did. You did. You did. But it was, yeah. was kind of nice to not have to take the subway anywhere. Mm -hmm. it, the, 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 it, watching you, Rabbi, stand in front of the ark for Avinu Malkinu, which you do anyway, but there was the camera and there were you right in front of us. It was not this distance. Yeah. It, it made it just different. Uh, well, everybody kind of at a front row seat. Yes, uh, no, on a stage right. level. At a stage uh, level, which even people in the front row seat aren't that close to the no uh, uh, bima itself. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody heard the services. Nobody. It was really good. You did a very nice job. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. It was. I Excellent. really didn't know if it was going to work. I really. Well, it it works. <laughs> I always call the high holidays uh, my bungee jumping. You I know, know but... you don't really kind of know. You have to take this and you just have to hope the whole, the rope holds, you know? It was beautiful. It really was. Well, it right. turns out, which is something that Harold Levine understands, that $35,000 cameras make a difference. Also, yeah. the quality, <laughs> there is something... Part of what you were able to experience is that, and this is Yolanda, and she needs credit for this. She found this fantastic production company, which isn't the mo wasn't there uh, wasn't the most expensive. It's a family company in New Jersey. And the guy who owns it, he owns it with his wife. She does the does the business side, you know, he does the uh, technical, technical tech, creative. Tech, right. He's very creative. He's not just a, you know, he's not just a technician. He's really sees himself as a as a filmmaker, you know, and that's part of what we loved about them, that he really understood <coughs> his job was to help mm -hmm. tell the story of CBST, not just, you know, put up a camera. And he showed us, you know, you can, he is the one camera that they used a lot. They, we had four cameras in the sanctuary, which I think you could, I don't know if you could. So there was one camera on Joyce and then one, two cameras really on me that would go shift and one camera on Sam, and kind of between Sam and me, there were three cameras, and then there was a camera in the balcony. And, uh, you know, it turns out you get what you pay for, that we really invested in this so that we could, because we wanted to, my goal was that the technology would help leap across the barrier of the distance. And it was seamless. It yeah. was absolutely seamless. Yeah. Oh, was right. happy. How fantastic was Janet Pavlov, huh? Yes. Was that amazing. Oh <laughs> and and <laughs> Sam singing. Safe. With, but Sam folks, singing. We'll get to Sam in a second. People have heard that, you know, that shofars aerosolize. Obviously, any any wind instrument, you're pushing out your. Right. And yeah. 
uh, Janet came in the week before and she was in the chapel and we set up the camera and a microphone and closed the door. So she was in there alone. I was uh. in the Wilson uh, social room there watching. I could see her and I could hear her and there was a, and I was mic'd so she could hear me. So we did it and we were very careful. We wanted one take. We wanted it to be live. We didn't, it, what, what you saw was Janet doing her thing, no retakes, but uh, because of the technology and the keeping safe because of what a wind instrument does and why we, is that we wanted to pre-record it so every one of us would be safe, including Janet and me and all the tech people. And she is just magnificent. It just was so beautiful. And we have a special treat for the Takiya Godola to end the ELA, which we're not telling anybody about, right, Janet? That's <laughs> Rabbi Mahenany was up was was breathtaking, was amazing too, as you walked in. And you know what? It was several people. I've talked to a lot of people. It was very real. There was a moment where you where we caught you looking like, do I go left? Do I go right with the camera? Right. And and we thought, okay, this is this is happening now. It's happening live. It's not overproduced. Right. It's not over -edged. exactly. And a number of us, Rabbi, also said that when you took out the Torah, it was like the part of the avodah service where the um, high priest goes in. Yeah, I I, 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 was, I was so choked up. I don't. I, I guess I was facing away from the camera. For it was so. There were a couple of moments where I was. The first Friday night that we were in the sanctuary, when we just started, I started crying, which I'm not a big crier, as you might guess. I don't really, uh, and when we just, and that service was really our dress rehearsal. You could, that's why we did that whole, did you like our little, that was Joyce's idea to do that, shh, it's a, the surprise is coming. Oh, yeah. And when you said live from 30th Street, I know. you <laughs> love that. Really exciting. You know, Rabbi, I, when you wrapped the Torahs, when you took them out, laid it out and wrapped it, it was as if you were caring for a baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. And thank, I kept saying, thank God, Rabbi Cohen, I yelled at Cohen, made sure we had a light Torah. I am not the strongest person in the world, so uh, that I had, I have to stand and hold that one Torah. I, I kept, we did such a good job of getting a light Torah so I could, uh, all of us, That the idea was that all of us who aren't the big lifters could could do it. Yeah, and there were breathtaking moments. One of my favorites was the Hineni. Watching you come in from outside, it was breathtaking. Right. Wasn't it fun to see 30th Street, to kind of see? Yeah, yeah. Right. That was right. A, I'll confess, that was my idea, to start from literally the outside, <laughs> not just the back of the sanctuary. Right, right. Everybody would see. It really worked. The yes. hardest thing, by the way, is that those doors are very hard to keep open. We've created very effective, and we had to, we had, I don't know if you, you couldn't see, but we had to use the people who brought sandbags you know, for the cameras, uh, because those doors are not made to keep open, they're made to keep shutting, you know, so it was... We did see that. You did see the sandbag? Oh, yeah. we, haven't, we haven't talked about the Psalms class favorite part, though. It was our Psalm 8 readers. What do you guys think, huh? How hey, fantastic was Amazing, that? amazing, amazing, right? Just, it was so amazing, really beautiful. We will, after Yom Kippur, everybody will get their own recording and we'll be able to uh, share uh, a link and we'll put them all together so everybody in the Psalms class can have them. Lisa Padilla um, was unable to, to be for some of it on, on Sunday because she was um she wasn't feeling well her mother called her and said you couldn't turn that that on and stay in bed yeah yeah but her mother called her and said isn't that your friend reading a song wow is <laughs> really it was so lovely to hear everybody you know we took a very big risk a lot of synagogues chose to totally pre-record everything because right. nobody knows if the technology you know if there'll be glitches but I felt really strongly that the core of the synagogue, the service needed to be live, even though we had a lot of pre-recorded elements because we also wanted to include a lot of people. And so uh, uh, we got to have a lot of people participate with the pre-records, but the service itself, the framework, we were going through the journey together. Lichot. 
We haven't mentioned Slicho. Slicho yes. was amazing. The way Sam with those candles and the light going on his face, it was like, it was yeah. wonderful. The choice to do it live was absolutely right. Absolutely. You know? I, mean, right. I don't know if you, you probably don't know this, but what I do for a living is direct multicam shoots. Wow. And I, I was 10 years on staff at TED doing that for the TED conference. Wow. So, so now I'm freelance. Um, and of course, all the live events have been canceled. But the feeling, especially for something spiritual, because I've been watching since around Passover, I've been watching, you know, when it's live, even, even though you provide the recordings, and I'm so glad because I have a time difference and I work and I can't always be there. The experience of watching you live versus the recording, which is Physically the same thing. It's yeah. an entirely well, different experience. And listen, during the uh, video that followed my ah! the first night, that's when I heard about RBG. Yeah. If, if I want you to be able to go through that trauma with everybody. Oh, so traumatic. Well, somebody actually put it in the chat of the service. I didn't see it. A minute or two before I did it. I put it in. Oh, yeah, oh, of course, I didn't see that. Not Not everybody was watching the chat, so it's just like that. I don't know who is the host today, but I do need privileges to screen share. Is it Tasha? Uh, Tasha, I think, is the host, or am I the host? Um, Well, you, I don't know. Who's CBST today? Tasha, are you there? I'm now the co-host. Okay, if everyone could mute themselves except for Adria Benjamin. Adria, will you tell us what you will be playing tonight, today? Adria, are you with us? I am. Yes. Sorry about that. I forgot how to unmute for Psalms class. Oh, no. (laughs) Whoa. Um, Keeping in mind with what everyone uh, we've been faced with over the past few days uh, and and keeping Rabbi Strash about Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, on my mind and what was what the rabbi spoke about at the Biden vigil and also this beautiful article that was in the New York Times a couple of days ago about a friendship that Eric Motley, who works at the Aspen Institute, struck up with Ruth Bader Ginsburg over the Goldberg variations. And uh, hearing Rabbi Holtzblatt mention La Dorvador at the service yesterday, I thought I would try and put all of those themes together for the morning.
So beautiful, Adria. And how spectacular was Adria's quartet doing Samachti on the first night of Rosh Hashanah? Wasn't that gorgeous? And Adria will be doing one of the Kol Nidres on Sunday night. Uh, that will be instrumental only, as she has done for many, many years. Um, so I just want to answer. People asked a few other questions that will, uh, since you're a part of the insider group, you'll get to hear. Let me see what are the questions. Just a second. Um, yes, I was, I had finished my drash and there was a video of that great song, which kind of got lost because of the news. Uh, um, so it was during that video, which followed my drash of the Matzis Yahoo song one day, which I love, by the way, that video, that's when I heard I, it was, uh, yeah, I almost fell to the ground. Um, Rabbi Rapport's drosh on sec first day was beautiful. I agree, really beautiful. She's just fantastic. And um, for those you might not have obviously gone into the kids services unless you had kids. Also, our programming for kids this year was incredible for all the different. <coughs> just remarkable what uh, Rabbi Rapport and Jennifer, uh, my niece, who is now our Limud principal, pulled off for the kids this year. Really fantastic. And that's, by the way, in the archive section of the website, I think all the services are there now. So if you want to go back and see anything again, I'm pretty sure it's all up there. I can't. It, it, it is there. It is there. Stuff, right? So if you yes, want to kind of go back and see what we did for the kids both days, you can see that. Um, and, uh, Rabbi, I just wanted to say, my uh, son registered my grandson for the zero to two uh, service and the congregation sent them a box and so Sydney had all kinds of things to part you know to what that he right. played with while he was watching the, the service it was incredible yeah we chose not to send something to the entire congregation which some synagogues did because of the expense and we just think most of, a lot of it's going to end up getting thrown out you know what I mean it's like tchotchkes it's more tchotchkes so we did send something to families with very small children so they would have something tactile <coughs> looking at a screen for you know a two-year-old or a one-year-old or an eight-month-old isn't really so we sent uh, 75 little packages out to all the kids who registered at that age group uh, rabbi rapport and jennifer were very creative including like little disco ball to represent light the creation of light and different things for every day of creation so that so that's what we sent. We sent to everybody. Is uh, Randy is Sarakoff on the call? Is Randy here today? I'm here. Yes, I am. Hi. Randy, my Randy is today meeting with the president of Keene College. She left this morning to go out to meet Keene College today. That is excellent news. Excellent news. Anyway, okay. Other questions before we go on to let's see. Um, Rabbi, one question. Uh, when you are conducting the services, you have a tendency not to give the page number or the place on the page. You pointed out to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I'm and so moved and carried away. So I, I will try to remember it. It's also there are more things I'm thinking about than usual. Do you know what I mean? So my brain power. And by the way, big shout out to Rabbi Kim Geringer, who did was on the chat, and hopefully she tried to pick up my uh flaws that way and she's just fabulous and she really loved doing it so uh big thank you to her and you should all thank her but you're right i in this one of the secrets is i for sure don't do the uh page number if we're just going one page like if it's if it's following but you're right and people have pointed out i sometimes forgot to tell people to sit down so there are people who pointed out they were still standing when i told them to stand again so yes, I I definitely that's yeah yeah my uh, yeah so anyway that's true. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry, Michael. Oh. How did it work having your machzor at home? Was it? I loved it, and that's why I wanted the page numbers in the middle of the page, and sometimes in the Hebrew I could follow it along, but the the reader would skip to the middle, and it was a little confusing. Yes, you're right. You're right. And, right, right. We also need, the better. 
We also need a written copy of the granola recipe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with, with the comments that you don't include the coconut, which made, made it for all of us. Yeah, I don't like the coconut. So uh, it's got to our- gotta be very, oh, sorry. It's got to be very strange for you not seeing the congregation. Yes. It is very strange, but what I've really worked hard on is what I understand actors who will deal with film is as I really think about all of you. I look at the camera and I think about all of you. So that I mean, you could also ask um, your 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 tech team to put a, a monitor in the like where the front row would be and to have the zoom on there and to have a grid so you can see home. some faces. Nobody's on zoom. So let, let's, oh, right. let's if we could, could we, we could we, figure something Marla, out. Marla, 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 Marla. We're, let's go to the Psalm 27 offerings, if we might, to make sure we go op- go through them today. And then, how, how does that sound, Rabbi? And then go back. There are more. I just want to, and I want to say, add one thing. Psalm 51 is the Psalm for Yom Kippur, which we we have a ways to get to Psalm 51. But if you want to do something between now and Sunday night as a Psalm study, I um, uh, recommend looking at Psalm 51. And enjoying Psalm 51 as a preparation, as one of your personal preparations for Yom Kippur. But let's go to Psalm 27, which is for the whole season. Yes. So, Kristen, are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Let me go to the full page here. And anything you'd like to say before, or you can just... Um, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'll just say briefly. I'm, usually I enlist Julia to sing my songs for me, um, but she's under the weather right now. So, um, so I've enlisted myself to sing my song. Um, let me just get my note. Well, well, please send our best to her and... I, yeah, she's good. She's, you know, for services, she's doing for Yom Kippur. So she's trying to just like, you know, rest her voice, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. Shahina Ori, Adonai, my light. Let them come for me. I hope they're ready to fight. I've got an army in you. I hope they're ready to fall. They're not the only ones who know how to build walls. Shahina ori Adonai, my light. Strengthen me, my oz chayai v'yishi for this time. Shahina ori Adonai, my light. Only one thing I need all the days of my life is a shelter in you. O rock to raise me on high. Let me sing my song through this wilderness night. Shahina ori Adonai, my light. Hear my voice, my oz chayai v'yishi. Don't hide from me, from me. Altas ter panecha, shechina ori Adonai, my light. Night falls like an ocean tide around me, Adonai. Turn to me. Turn to me. Midnight goes on and on. Turn to me, Shekhinah. The dawn. Shekhinah ori, Adonai, my light. I got a fire in me. Let the spirit burn bright. Shekhinah ori, Adonai, my light. I look to you, my oz chayai v'yishi. Shekhinah ori, Adonai, my light. That's fantastic. And you have a beautiful voice. Thanks. What a, what, a, what a power musical couple you guys are. So talk to us about this. And I love your starting with the Ori and using Shekhinah there. Beautiful. So talk to us. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think for me, I, 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 they both feel incomplete and together it feels more uh-huh. complete. So I really want to keep those. Um, I mean, I, 
uh, for this psalm, you know, typically when I write something rooted in text, I'll take out just like a, you know, a few sentences or even just an idea. And for this one, I just decided I really wanted to follow the psalm as closely as I could and just really follow the arc of it. Um, and then the other thing is in, in songs that I've written in the past, if I've included Hebrew, I've, I've had to call on Julia to like figure out the Hebrew part of it because I, I couldn't read it. Um, but I, but I've, I've since I can read Hebrew now very slowly and haltingly, but I can read it and I decided I wanted to try to, you know, do that part on my own. For huh? the most part. So I, it was kind of like, a, uh, I just gave myself a little bit of a, a challenge, a change. Well, I think it's gorgeous and I love the theme of light, as you know. So to have that as that motif through there is just fantastic. Thank you. And I like the image. I've got an army in you. Mm. Uh, beautiful. Thank you. All right. Thank I understand from Harold, we have how many today, Harold? So we want to make sure we're going to actually- We have get... about 10. So okay. we're going to- I want to make sure we get everybody in today. Yael is next. She had she asked she has to leave a little early, so she asked to go next. Yael. Yes. Abandonment and forgiveness. Wait, you, you need to be a little louder, Yael. We don't hear you. Coming with your mic. And, and Rabbi, I'm gonna mute you while she's reading because yes, I'm sorry. you have a phone or something. No, I just... All right, Yael. Is this better? Is this better? a little bit. Just uh, right into the mic and loudly. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Hold on. I need. Okay. Abandonment, abandonment and forgiveness. My grandmother abandoned my mother. It, it wasn't her fault. She was killed by the Nazis. My mother never found a house of calm to dwell in. My mother abandoned me. It wasn't her fault. She was traumatized by the Nazis. I found a house of calm to dwell in. I forgive her. Oh, yeah, El, this is so deeply moving. What a psalm of this season. Talk to us a little bit. I mean, we've been with you on this journey, too. Yes. So. <clears throat> Sorry, the kind of two themes. One is, I was really struck when we talked about how the the line where it talks about my mother and father abandoned me, it doesn't have to be um, intentional. And that really struck me that abandonment is not always about intending to abandon. And, and there was something kind of healing about that. Uh -huh. Uh, and the forgiveness, because we are, you know, right before Yom Kippur, and that makes sense to kind of put these mm -hmm. together. So, you know, and we've talked before about the trauma over generations, and that's something that, you know, I dealt with and continue to deal with. And so I wanted to show how that happens, you know, from generation to generation, but there can be uh, repairing experiences that break the cycle. And it's a, understanding the gap between intention and impact is a pretty powerful, I think, stop along that journey towards forgiveness. And that's what you're talking about. Sometimes abandonment is intentional. There's no question, but sometimes it's not. Just like sometimes the intention is good and the effect is bad, or, or the intention is simply not taken, like in your, both your mother and your grandmother's experience it was completely out of their control their intention would never have been to hurt a child of theirs or not be there for them uh so this is and it's a do you see how staying with the psalm deeper than one reading you begin to see the part the the possibilities of this multi-layered prism that just crash open everything and and it can also mean people who are parents who are cruel to their children. There are parents who are cruel to their children. And no matter what the excuse, it doesn't, it's not okay, right? But there are, so, so it's very powerful that all of that can be held into this pasuk. Thank you, really beautiful. And also, it also gives us uh, some generosity towards ourself as a mother to our own children, the mistakes that we make Understanding if our intentions are good, we hope our children will forgive us. 
who is next here? Shep is next. Shep, and I believe this is your first offering ever. In well, it's my first. I did it very quickly. I'm not very happy with it. All right, Shep, we, want, we don't want to talk about it. I, I, could you, I wanted Jeremy to read it because I, I can't. Um, if he's not here, could Sherry Dratchell do it for me? Sherry? Yeah, do it, Sherry. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Sherry. Sure. I'll be on mute. Adonai, you are my light and my way. What shall I fear? I fear my own feelings when evil thoughts eat me up from inside. I know you will guide me to accept my true self. It is your voice that I hear in my heart, giving me the courage to be who you meant me to be. I am assailed from within and not by others. Mm. The one thing I ask of you, Lord, the one thing I seek to dwell in God's house all of my life and behold the beauty of your creation with me a part of it. Should negative thoughts and fear of the unknown besiege my heart, I will maintain confidence that you will lead me to victory. Do not forsake me in my hour of need. Show me your face. Though may, many have already abandoned me, I know you will not. Shelter me in your tent, but lead me out of mine. Light my path and give me hope that there is truly is a way out. Then I will hold my head high as I reclaim my pride. Wow, Shep. First of all, Sherry, thank you for that beautiful reading. Now, Shep, would you talk to us a little bit about it? It was an extra part I had, but um, I was just moved by, well, you said we can pick any part of the psalm. So mm -hmm. I was moved by how Bernstein ended her interpretation, and it sounded kind of gay to me coming out. So without using the word gay, I intended this to be like um, an affirmation of a person struggling to come out and needing God's help. And I didn't know which name to call God, so I called God four different names. Uh-huh. That's very Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Eternal because God, I don't know, Lord, whatever. So by having multiples, we're showing there is enough, no one thing is adequate. And I, I love this line that, um, I, that you are relating to the Psalm from that internal sentence, sentiment. I fear my own feelings when evil thoughts eat me up from the inside, referring to that pasuk that talks about evil uh, doers or people eating my flesh. I know you will guide me to accept my true self. It is your voice that I hear. That's very, very beautiful. And again, you're using those psukim that talk about being assailed and you're very much experiencing this as the internal. Um, do not forsake, just very beautiful. Thank you. My first time out. <laughs> good, good job, Shep. Really good job. And you know something? For some people struggling over writing and taking hours and rewriting, that's a style and that's a way of doing it. And for other people, just putting something down on paper and that's it. That's also, there isn't one way to write. Like there isn't one way to have feelings. There isn't one way to produce a piece of art. And um, so just know whatever it is that works for you. Do it. I think and once you do it one time, you feel, um, I feel more confident to pursue it again. True with most things, right? And just trust true. your own process. Don't try and do it the way somebody else does it. Because each of us, some people are editors and want to work over every word and every punctuation point, And that's the beauty of that process. Some people wake up and we've heard over and over again. Some people have woken up and just said, oh, here it is. And plunk, it's down on paper. You really have to figure out what works for you. Uh, the most important thing is to engage with the psalm and to make it meaningful for you. There isn't a single way to do it. There isn't a single style. There isn't a single, it's, it is as, as, as diverse as the human beings we are. So this is beautiful, Shep. Thank you. Keep writing. Thank you, Sherry. Linda Thank Solomon. You. And Linda, could you give me a, a level check first? You were a little low when we were- How are we doing now? Good, if you could just lean in and go a little louder because people are I'll having- I'll little... try my best. Okay, go ahead, it's all you. Okay. Um... 
I'm going to read from mine because I think you didn't get the corrections, okay? When I was a child in my bed and I was afraid, my father or my mother would come and sit by my bedside until I fell asleep and I would not be afraid. As I grew older, I lost my father. I knew my life would not be the same. I sought comfort in your temple, Adonai, but I was still afraid. I retreated to the arms of my mother for the shelter I could find. Then, in my young adulthood, I lost my mother. And now both my father and my mother had left me for their own peaceful reward. And I am alone. Something pulled me back to you, Adonai. I don't know why, but I am not afraid because you, Adonai, have taken me in and made me feel safe. When my parents died, I cried out in my loneliness and abandonment. And you heard me, Adonai. You answered me. You heard this lost soul's cry, and you enfolded me in your embrace so that I would no longer be lost and afraid. When I was surrounded by enemies, Adonai lifted me up upon a high rock to watch how those who betrayed me were defeated by Adonai's mere presence, and they can harm me no more. When naysayers and evildoers have tried to shame me personally, or because I trusted Adonai, it is the Mighty One who showed them how wrong they were, and they were defeated. When my demons kept me from sleeping or filled me with physical pain, you kept me from moving or kept me from moving, I beseeched you, Adonai, to hear me, to see me, and you did. I prayed for one thing only, that you, Adonai, would never turn your face from me as I will never turn mine from you. Had I not experienced your goodness and kindness, I would be floundering in the desert still, caught in the onslaught of my enemies, my demons. But I have seen your glory and righteousness, and I would beg you to always let me know your light. This is my message. Be not afraid. Believe in Adonai as Adonai will always believe in you. See Adonai, see the light. I was muted. Beautiful. You know, I was thinking this, this reference to losing your, your mother and your father in this young age. I was thinking about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg lo losing her mother the day before her high school graduation. Um, so powerful. Okay, so talk to us a little bit first. Just really beautiful. Well, I lost my father right after my graduation, uh -huh. high school graduation. So, uh, you know, it was very, very similar. Um, this po this psalm has always, that part of the psalm has always been what I focused on. And every time I speak it or hear it, I get a gasp at that line. My parents yep. have abandoned me because... That's how I always felt, and this is not really a poem, it's more freestyle prose, but um, I, I had to focus on what was and how I've come forth from that, and that was because of my relationship with God and CBST, I should say, <laughs> as well. So well, that's, that's basically what it was about and, and where, you know, and then there's the teacher part of me. I felt I ended with a, um, a directive to other people as a teacher would. Yep. Be not afraid. So what I loved about that, Linda, is that that's very much often the Psalms do that, right? You feel that the Psalm writer is learning something and then the Psalms often end kind of with a coda that's a little bit like, we see in Psalm 27, trust in God, have hope, have courage. The coda isn't, is like to the outside world. It, of course, to us, we're always speaking to ourselves, but a bit of that I love. The psalmist is also a teacher. It's, it's like a, um, you know, when we read a folk story or a, what's called a fairy tale, which I only, there's a nimshal, a moral to the story. And sometimes it gets repeated quite, 
directly. Sometimes it's in the text itself. Um, and uh, this is, and I like the, the sense of not knowing the mystery here that I like very much. Something pulled me back to you. I don't know. I don't know why. And that's uh, when my parents died, I cried out in loneliness and abandoned me. You heard me. And again, you're showing that abandonment here is your parents' death and not because they were cruel. No, right. I, so, I had very loving parents. I was a very lucky girl. Mm -hmm. I had very loving parents. One of my favorite photographs is of um, my father and myself when I was about seven in Prospect Park, and we were sitting on a bench. And he has me engulfed in his arms. And that to me was one of my favorite pictures always of my father. And I have one of my mother like that as well. Beautiful. I see you kind of publishing this when we get up to publishing Psalm 27 with those photographs. Oh, okay. Yeah. That'd be beautiful. beautiful, Linda. Thank you. All right. So writing. Keep writing, Linda. This is Scott Soloway. Hi, Scott. Hi. Okay. Um, to Scott, you. thank you for those transliterations. Did they get to folks? Were they helpful? Uh, Great. Thank you so uh, much. It's my pleasure. I, I hope it was helpful. Uh, to you, a reflection of the divine, and to Hashem, my light and saving grace, from whom should I fear? You give me strength to live without terror. The poisonous influences that close in on me, that I allow close, eat at me and constrain and narrow me. They become my enemies that will stumble and fall. If an encamped army comes down on me, my heart will not fear, even should war come upon me. I will trust my fearless heart. I ask you for oneness. I beg for it. I have sat in this world all the days of my life, longingly envisioning true delight, visiting, scrutinizing every corner of your sanctuary. You hide me like a treasure, sheltering me on those bad days. You nestle me in the secret places of your tent, then raise me on a rock, so that now my head is high over my surrounding challengers, and I will sacrifice in that tent, a sacrifice of joy, and fight. I will sing and I will chant. Hear my voice calling out, have mercy on me, answer me. My heart says to you, ask after me, beckon me, look at you. As I ask after you, beckoning you, turn your face to me. Don't obscure yourself or hide your face. Don't hold yourself back. Don't bend away. Don't stretch your anger out over me as I work for you by your side. You have been my help. Don't leave me hanging. You indeed saved me. My father and mother left me, left me free, and you will gather me up. Teach me your ways, keep me walking straight, upright, facing all hostility. Don't leave me feeling the breath of my enemies, liars who come upon me, blustering, breathing out violence. Oy, if I didn't believe, I would see goodness in the world we live in. I hold out hope for you. I say, be strong. Courage will come. Wait for it. Expect and always hope. Beautiful, Scott. So talk to us a little bit. Um. Well, I, I really, again, I tried to sort of start with the words and of the, of the language and, and okay. sort of play around with that um, uh, first. Um, and the beginning, it was actually quite difficult, as, as other people mentioned. I mean, I was putting God in everywhere, because God is in the, the psalm everywhere. And, um, and, and I was so relieved. I was actually embarrassed, almost, at the beginning, because I was leaving God, I was like, I'm, I think I'm going to leave God out of this because the first two words when, and we talked about this in the, in the class, right? Le David Adonai. And somehow the juxtaposition of those two things made me think about the, the, the way in which we talk to each other and we, that we talk to God. And that oftentimes, 
and I can say this at least for myself, that when I'm saying something very uh, deeply um, uh, vulnerable about myself, it's in a way easier to share that, uh, those feelings that one has with God or with something outside than to each other. And so I thought actually maybe better to, to take what we learn about our relationship with God and direct it actually. Beautiful. You know, my writing to people. Wow, that's and beautiful. So to a lover, to each other. And that was, that was how, how, what I came up with. Beautiful. I, there are some of the phrases here that are just, and also I see obviously you're very close to the original text and you're exploding of it. The poisonous influences that close in on me that I allow close. I mean, how many of us can reflect or can relate to that, right? We allow these poison, they come close to us and that I allow close, eat at me and constrain and narrow me. They become my enemies that will stumble and fall. So what a powerful, beautiful uh, verse there. Um, if an encamped enemy comes down on me, my heart will not fear. Even should war come upon me, I will trust my fearless heart. I ask you for oneness. I beg for it. I have sat in this world all the days of my life, lovingly envisioning true delight, visiting, scrutinizing every corner. What a gorgeous exploration of these words. You hide me like a treasure. What a beautiful image. Hidden doesn't necessarily mean bad. And this goes a little bit to what Mikey Goldstein you hide me. I'm hidden like a treasure, not because I have something to be ashamed of or fear, but because I'm a treasure sheltering me on those bad days. You nestle me in the, I just love this. And um, I just urge people as we go through these next 43 days to keep reading your Psalm 27. This is going to, these, the, your writings will give me a lot of strength. And that's part of what the point is to keep repeating these words. So that now my head is high over my surrounding challenges. I will sacrifice in that tent a sacrifice of joy and fight. I will sing and I will chant. Beautiful, Scott. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Let's see. Who is next? I believe Sarah Siegel. Sarah, are you with us today? I am. How are things down south? Um, colder than they've been. Ah. Uh, but nice. Um, okay, here we go. Looks like you have artwork on the wall. You've all unpacked. Yeah, yeah, finally. Um, okay. Okay. For David, for, sure. For David, who begat Edie Rose, who begat me. She was a child of God, really God, God's self at first. She nursed me with milk, light, and safety then. When I played with Lego in the corner during my mother's Weight Watchers meetings, I didn't imagine sugar devouring me the way it seemed to be devouring my mother. And when the army of my uh, mom's moods attacked me, I learned to disarm it. To teach me a lesson, she left me in the car during a grocery shopping spree when I was three. The legend was, upon her return, I asked irresistibly, friends now? She caved. One thing my therapist asked, can you be for yourself the mother you never had? I didn't want just a mother, I wanted the ultimate protector, the ultimate fortifier. Sometimes she was both, sometimes she was the sweetest, the loveliest. Once when my friend Amy called with a change of plans, Amy opted to meet Jill instead of me that day. My mother was crushed for me. She bought me a ticket to Beatlemania. Mm. To the matinee that day, I didn't even love the Beatles. At that time, I recognized only a gift horse, not the social rejection, nor my mom's protective, albeit outsized, response to it. During the Beatlemania era, I began saying silently when I was alone, excuse me to God, excuse me to myself whenever I burped. God was with me at all times then. I didn't need for us to seek each other's face. I needed God to help me save face. Just one example. During a more scattered mood, my parents left me at the Greenwich rest stop on the Merritt Parkway, driving for half an hour, never noticing that I wasn't in the way back of the station wagon. Oh my God. The gas jockey had to call the state police. I sat with him and pretended nothing unusual had happened. Politely, I accepted his offer of hot chocolate. 
Christ and waited impassively for their return. God kept me on a level path, no matter how steep and scary my mother and father made it. The safe, milky light of my babyhood was gone, and some harrowing stuff had happened at home in the interim. But also some sweet, some lovely and sweet stuff. Years later in this context, my wife taught me the term intermittent reinforcement. It was what kept me hopeful the whole time. In the end, sugar defeated neither my mother nor me, though it might have killed my father, who died of common bile duct cancer at 56. He died when he was a year older than I am now. While still in the land of the living, three weeks before my mom died in her sleep at 88, she declared, Sarah, you're the best person I know. My mother's moods were my enemy and she herself my ultimate fortifier. Mm. Beautiful and so powerful. Can you be for yourself the mother you never had? Wow. So talk to us about this. I'm just going to have to turn on my AC again, so I'll turn it on mute. Uh, um, I don't know. I was thinking about it. Like, uh, I guess I would say I related to when others have spoken about siblings going to their parents and saying, look how you messed me up. Um, I wrote a, an unpublished memoir years ago uh, that my therapist said, whatever you do, uh, do not show this to your mother. And it, it detailed everything that I, you know, experienced all of the really, like that, that was the funniest version of, of the times that my mother lost us, okay? <laughs> um, during, you know, Chinese New Year in Chinatown when we were six and 11. Um, stuff like that. So uh, I wrote this memoir and my mom's like, I want to read it. And I let her read it. She read it and she said to me, um, I don't remember any of it, but I'm sorry. And, you know, that's really what it came down to. Um, she didn't remember any of it. I'm sure she was dissociated during all of it, but the thing is, the other thing I've heard you talk about, Rabbi Kleinbaum, in, in these sessions, especially lately, is the whole power of resilience. And I don't know, I'm looking right now out at some crepe myrtles uh, that are bordering our property. They're raspberry colored. And at my neighbor's pool, that's bright blue. And at our pool, that's bright blue. And there's beauty and... Um, you know, my mother did have very powerful, powerfully beautiful things she did. I, I'll just say one extra one. I was talking with one of you from the class the other day. My mom, um, when she realized that Pat and I would not be able to be buried in our Orthodox synagogues cemetery, um, offered to disinter my father and move him to the CBST cemetery um, if we wanted. So my mother was nuts and the best mother you ever wanted. So there it is. And, and I'm sure- that sums, that sums it up, right? I mean, and also you don't know what your mother was going through that made her so unable to be the mother you needed at the time. And that's, you know, we learned- You remind me of one uh, extra thing that- uh, I have to, unfortunately, I have to cut you off because we were gonna try and complete all of these, but- yeah. Put it in the chat. Maybe write it in the chat. So we could thank you so much for this. It's really, I think many of us can relate to it. Ben? Ben Schaffern, are you with us today? Yes, I am. Good morning. Hi, Ben. Hope to God, a banality of our godless times. Hope to God and be start of heart the endless search of the ancients. Teach me your way, they said, and I will feel not. I don't think, nor can I know whether you gathered me when my parents left me, God, but I certainly abandoned you, but not your way. Righteousness, righteousness pursue, your own writing, show me the road for you to follow me. 
Fantastic. Hope to, so talk to us about how you got from Psalm 27 to this. What was your process? Um, I do is an expression of trust and hope in the divine. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if it's. Right. Rabbi, mean? I think that you need to. You have background noise. I think if you mute yourself, we can hear Ben a little better. Okay, Ben, go ahead. Okay. I, it, to me, reading the psalm originally, it was an ex. To, uh, it showed me the writer's expression of total trust in, in the Almighty and uh, just being able to abandon oneself to the Almighty. But reading it, I, I the exact uh, direction. And I started with the last verse where it says, Kaveh El Adonai, which in Hebrew is hope to God. And that, that's how I started with. Uh, and it seemed like such a banality. And, and everything else, including my mother and my father abandoned me. When I first read that, it was like a bolt of lightning. My mother died when I was a year old. And for the rest of my life, I spent perhaps a total of four years in my father's home. And... It made me turn away from the religion, totally. But not from the precepts of godliness and um, the divine that's inherent in, in all human beings. And that's what I tried to express. This is so deeply moving, Ben. And the honesty and the... Uh... Deep truth here is very, very moving. When my parents left me, God, but I, you gathered me, and, but I certainly abandoned you, but not your way. That's spectacular, Ben. Spectacular. Thank you. Barb Segura. Is Barb with us today? Does anyone see her on chat or participants? So, since you, I'm going to read Barb's. I don't, yeah, I don't see her on the list. She's not here today, just so we've read it. Yeah. In the eye of my storm is stillness. I wait. I wait for the mystery to unfold. It always does. Wow. This is in the IRA category of going into the very kind of the 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 point of the essence with as few words. Very beautiful. Wow. We'll, we'll thank Barb for that when she rejoins us next week. So we have a minute left. Um, Randy, you had your alternative version. I think we have a minute for you to read it. Thank you. Uh, that's the wrong one. It's number one, please, Harold. Right. This is my poem inspired by Psalm 27. Abba, can you hear me? Mom, you were my protector, my friend, my world. You and dad taught me to fear everything. Mom and dad, you taught me to trust no one but family. Be afraid of the world. When others drew near me, you sheltered me from them and called them enemies. Today, that is why I stumble and fall. Parents, you taught me that the world that existed outside our family equated a, an army camped outside our home, ready to attack us. Always have fear in your heart. You taught me to be afraid of the other. Trust no one but family and never be confident. The one thing I ask, the thing that I seek from my mom and my dad to see me, the true me, your daughter, the lesbian, pinko, hippie, bleeding heart, liberal. But I am still young. And if you see me for who I truly am, you will not allow me to live in your house anymore. I protect myself from the truth, hiding my true self, concealing who I am from the world and within my own mind. Hiding under a rock in the house of my mother and father on the until the truth is revealed 
at the age of 33. Now, my head begins to rise to the occasion with critical thought. I rediscover yud heh vav -Hey and learn that humanity as a whole is not my enemy. I study the Book of Psalms with CBST each day singing Acha Sha'alti. I cry out in song and prayer to yud heh vav -Hey, hoping to be seen and heard. yud heh vav -Hey, will you answer me? In the closet, I hid my true face from myself, my family, and the world. I seek Yudhei Vavhei's presence. I want to know the face of Hashem. Please, Yudhei Vavhei, do not abandon me. You are my help. Help me find redemption. Though my dad and my mom abandoned me, I was taken in by Yudhei Vavhei and by strangers who have become my chosen family. CBST took me in and welcomed me, the true me, the real me. At CBST, I was taught a new path, a way of acceptance and love, love and compassion for myself, others who are like me, and those who are different from me. I cannot be delivered back to the will of my father and mother. Void of critical thought, they have led their family into a cult of false facts and dangerous lies spewing from the Pharaoh in the White House. If I had not believed in my true self, I would not have the strength to see the good in others. I have faith in the goodness of people. I want to be the reason others believe in the goodness of people. I have hope in yud heh vav -Hey. I find strength within my heart to have courage to go on in these dark times. I hope for the presence of yud heh vav -Hey. Amen. Just spectacular. And is that our last one for today? Is that yes, our last one? I believe that is our last what one for today. What, um, what a way for us to end this, Randy, since this has been your psalm and you've spent all these years literally with it. Uh, how profound and beautiful. And the reminder that life is full of a lot of pain. There, there is pain and we're not going to get rid of the pain, but how, how we can learn from things and their suffering can bring us to deeper truths and to be, uh, to be there to bring us closer to what we imagine or what we feel to be the deepest truths of all. So thank you, thank you, thank you for this. Thank you for this class. Thank you. So nice to see everybody again and so happy to be together. I've missed you very much. What number for Yom Kippur did you say? 51, Psalm 51 is the Yom Kippur Psalm for those who want to look at it closely. Carrie and Debbie, hello, hello, hello. Nice to have you guys here. And we're going to join together again on Wednesday. We're not meeting Monday and Tuesday. I mean, Monday we're meeting, but not as a Psalms class. It is Yom Kippur. Um, and by the way, Friday night, I'll be back in my apartment, everybody. We're not going to be doing it live from the sanctuary. Uh, uh, but I'll be back, but we will be live, but not from the sanctuary. But Sunday night is Yom Kippur, and the same link that you used for Rosh Hashanah will work for Yom Kippur, so you'll get another email. How fabulous, and send me those emails to, if you've registered. Um, and Marilyn Michon, I like your sweater. You gotta update it though, we got a new election happening. And two, Wednesday, we start. So what psalm are we up to, Harold? 12. 12. Wow, we're boogieing through. So on Tuesday, we will start with Psalm 12, and we will just continue through. <coughs> I think Sukkot this year, all Yuntavs are on the weekend, so we'll continue studying through Kolomoid Sukkot. If you don't understand what I just said, don't worry. Uh, I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll, but I, I don't think we miss any days for Sukkot, is my point. I'm not exactly sure. We'll check. Um, so blessings to everybody. I'm so happy to see you all. Pray for me for Sunday night. I, when I look in that camera, I really do see you. I don't need, I don't need uh, the blow up dolls or the pictures or the, you know, the, I thought I would. I don't. I really see all of you and I feel you with me and I feel you. And even though we're so far apart physically, I can't say, it was such a deeply, spectacularly religious experience for me. And I pray I have something meaningful to say 
And if I don't, you'll write a poem about it and make it meaningful. So I have total faith that you've now developed your muscles to make meaning out of whatever I say. So you'll find something, uh, even if it's, if it's through your lens. Uh, so I'll see you everybody Friday night. And we're going to lend with some music from our beloved Adria. Um, Friday night, services are at 6.30. Shabbat morning, services are at 9.30. All of those services will be from our homes. We're back to the... Uh, I got to clean up my apartment now. <laughs> All right. So, Adria, with that beautiful um, uh, mix, mix of um, Bach and Lador Vador. By the way, before Adria begins... If folks have not seen Rabbi Lauren Holtzblatt's uh, memorial service that took place at the Supreme Court yesterday, she is the senior rabbi of the largest conservative synagogue in DC, which is the kind of the, the conservative, there's a, there's a reform synagogue that all the government people belong to and there's a, reform, a conservative, this is the conservative one. And our member Liz Shire is a member of this synagogue and she is a fabulous rabbi. And she did a beautiful, beautiful, short memorial service at the Supreme Court. So Google it so you can, um, it's on YouTube, I'm sure. Both the part before where a hundred of her former clerks lined up outside the Supreme Court, over a hundred former law clerks lined up and law clerks carried the justice's casket up into the uh, rotunda of the, of the Supreme Court and uh, Rabbi Holtzblatt led a very brief but beautiful, beautiful service. Rabbi, if, there, if there's any way for people to hear what you said last night during the Biden tribute to RGB, it was we can't, wonderful. We can't publish that on CBST because that was a partisan event. Um, so Sherry, you would have to distribute it. Uh, <laughs> or I'll, we'd have I'll to think about it. Sherry, it's on Facebook. If you go to Facebook and type in Joe Biden, it will take you to it. Okay, okay. I, I can't distribute it through CBST channels. Okay. All Harold? right. Everybody. Can I say something? Can I say something very quickly? I had to put my Reuben down this morning. Oh. And I, oh, and I knew, Sorry. and I knew that I was coming back to this class and to hear everybody, uh, and it it, it 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 has helped me through this uh, horrible moment. Oh, I'm so so sorry, Devora. I know how much you loved him. May he be at peace now. I how told him to go look for Arnold and and Schmooza. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Sherry. Bob did it. All right. Adria will play us out as we carry all. Yes. Harold, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down to the Hashivenu of Klepper, I think I'll use that as the play out. <coughs> this is okay. one of the pieces that um, uh, usually opens the uh, Kol Nidre service with the chorus singing. So please sing along if you like. On mute, of course. <laughs>
spectacular, Adria. Thank you so much. You carry all of us. Yes, and you do those me. of you, yes, by yes, the you way, Rosh Pina folks, I'll see you tonight. Yes. Rosh Pina is tonight. Otherwise, everybody, I'll see you tomorrow night at Shul. Shabbat right. Shalom. Bye -bye. Blessings Th to everybody. Thank Shabbat you during a busy Shabbat week for being. The Yom Kippur greeting is Gemar Hatima Tova, that you may your uh, ceiling, ceiling, not as in the ceiling of her, uh, uh, the room, but S E A L I N G. In other words, we say on Rosh Hashanah, you're inscribed in the Book of Life, and on Yom Kippur, you're sealed in the Book of Life. So between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we say, Gemar Hatima Tova, Hatima is the seal. Uh, literally, it's a seal. A Hatima is the seal. So, Gemar Hatima Tova, may you be sealed for the good. So that's the, or, or you could just say, Gemar Hatima, or you could just say, Happy Yom Kippur, whatever works. Okay, everybody. And in, and in Aussie language, well over the fast. Yes, and we say have an easy fast because if you have an easy fast, it means you're healthy. And so we, we don't say, uh, so when you say to somebody you have an easy fast, it means we hope, uh, we hope you are, you, uh, whatever you get from the fast. But I want to remind everybody, you do not fast if you have any health concerns. There is an absolute injunctive injunction in Judaism to not fast if there's a health issue and you're completely exempt. But nobody is exempt from getting a flu shot. Everybody in this Psalms class must get a flu shot. If you've never done it before, you must do it this season. And if you have any questions or concerns, talk to me directly. I, um, I got my flu shot uh, the week before Rosh Hashanah and I encourage everybody to do it. Bye bye, Rabbi, everybody. Rabbi, thank you for the busiest week of the year making this hour to spend with us. It was thank you, Harold. Harold and I talked, and we both said we missed ever this so much, but it was Harold's idea. So thank you, Harold, for making this happen. All right. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye, everybody. Thank and you. And next Wednesday, we start again and we keep going. Psalm 11.